Well, listen, thanks everyone for, for being here. Um, my name is Wade Crowfoot, and I'm really proud to serve as secretary of our Natural Resources Agency. Um, this is, all right, the guy that we invited to give the presentation is clapping for me. Um, thanks, Jacob. Uh, so this is the first and what we hope are a series of discussions where we are bringing uh, people from outside of the agency in to talk about new emerging ideas that are not fully institutionalized into our work, but that are really intriguing. Um, my criteria for these is they have to be interesting uh, because you're giving up the middle part of your day. Uh, and this is a very interesting topic as I'll talk about in a second. Um, just wanna take a quick snap poll to understand uh, who's here today. Uh, raise your hand if you work for the Natural Resources Agency. Okay, raise your hand and, and uh, if you're my staff and I made you come so that uh, if there was no one coming, we wouldn't look, uh, be too embarrassed. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, so a lot of folks from the Resources Agency. How about if you're from another state agency? All right, a few. If you're from a local or federal agency, okay, and if you don't work in state government. All right, great, excellent. Our goal, our goal with these uh, discussions is to make them uh, open to the public and to really bring a bunch of people together that uh, wouldn't otherwise come together on an interesting topic. Um, truthfully, we had no idea if we'd have 10 people or 100 people. I think we're up to capacity, so it seems like this topic or the potential to talk about interesting subjects uh, is popular, is a, is a good idea. So we'll look toward getting a, a bigger venue potentially uh, for the next uh, discussion. Um, big thanks to our sign language interpreter and uh, the suggestion of Valerie Termini from the Department of Fish and Wildlife to stream this uh, live on the, on the web. Uh, we're an agency of 19,000 people. We have about over, just over 3,000 in this building. So most of our colleagues actually don't work in this building and not in Sacramento. So this gives us an opportunity to share uh, these presentations with uh, our colleagues across the state. So I'll just say I'm really excited about the topic and I'm excited about the presenters. So much in water policy in the state can be characterized as conflict. Fish versus farms, urban versus rural, north versus south. And what one, uh, one important priority of Governor Newsom's is to try to break through that old paradigm and find ways that work across different stakeholder groups for the environment, for water users. And finding ways to reactivate the natural floodplain in the Central Valley is one of those win-win solutions. So I won't belabor the introduction and simply introduce David Guy from the Northern California Water Association uh, who originally suggested this presentation. Thank you, good afternoon. Great to see everybody. Wow, what a turnout. Thanks, uh, Secretary uh, Crowfoot, for uh, allowing us to have the honor of being part of your inaugural uh, speaker series and for creating such a buzz. What a, what a lot of energy in this room, and we're just really excited by, uh, by that. So uh, is what we're going to do today is encourage you and ask you to join us in reimagining our water system today uh, through uh, some science, through some film, through some water management, through some ecosystem management. Please uh, join us in reimagining our water system as we think about ways in this new way forward that we like to talk about. Like Wade, we were encouraged when the governor called out that we're gonna break down these binaries, and that's why we're here today, because this is one of many efforts to do that. And obviously, we appreciated that the governor had the uh, uh, thought to look at floodplains in the uh, Central Valley. We're also thrilled, of course, with the uh, water resilience portfolio and the efforts that many of you are, are doing. Uh, thank you for all of your team, too, in putting this together, Wade. You've got an amazing team here at the Natural Resources Agency. But obviously, uh, part B here is utilizing natural infrastructure, and that's what you're gonna hear a little bit about uh, today. And then, uh, most recently, we were very encouraged when the governor signed a budget uh, based on a lot of the work at the Natural Resources Agency to give floodplains a catalyst with a basic basically $100 million of funding to really start moving some of these efforts forward. And a lot of people around this room, I think, are involved in these efforts, which is really uh, thrilling and what we want to uh, build upon today. And then I think the most exciting thing about this is the partnerships. Uh, this is a list of some of the partners. We have a lot more that couldn't fit on a page. And then even within this group, you have a handful today that are gonna talk about some of the uh, opportunities to reactivate the floodplain. Uh, but we just have a wonderful partnership group and really a team that's uh, moving forward on this. Uh, so with that, I'm gonna switch uh, and introduce our uh, first uh, speaker, which is uh, Jacob uh, Katz, to talk a little bit about the science. Uh, Jacob's uh, modest um, in a lot of ways, um, not in other ways, um, but... Uh, <laughs> 
I, I think if uh, any of you, uh, how many people have seen the recent uh, publication from the California Academy of Sciences uh, biographic? Well, they are. All right. I'm her uh, PR person. Um, anyway, read the biographic. Uh, wonderful format, wonderful story, and just one of the most recent examples of uh, a lot of the emerging science in this area. So, uh, Jacob Katz. Thank you, David. Thank you, Wade. Well, we all here in the Sacramento know uh, the Sacramento Valley know it as this this incredible tapestry of of agricultural production. Um, but before development, it was an incredible mosaic of of wetland habitats, uh, a shifting mosaic of different kinds of of marsh, of uh, emergent wetland, of of riparian jungle along our our rivers, uh, and it was really one of the world's great wildlife landscapes, um, that these wetlands really define the valley, that uh, before they were the names of counties, these words that you know, Calusa, Butte, Sutter, American, Yolo, those were the names of the flood basins, of the ephemeral lakes, of the wetlands that really characterize how the Sacramento Valley worked. Um, that rapidly changed. What used to be a system that every winter, every spring, with rainfall, with snow melt, the rivers would swell, the water would breach the natural levees and spread out across that, that mosaic of different wetlands. Um, but with 13,000 miles of levees, completed in just a little over a century, with wholesale alteration to the way that water flows across that landscape, from a landscape that used to be about long duration, weeks or months of water flowing and spreading across the land, to one in which ubiquitous drainage really had the landscape drying as quickly as possible. What do we mean, ubiquitous drainage? Well, think not just every farm field, those farm fields that used to be marshes that were drained, that were levied, but your backyard a Safeway parking lot. Really, the entire human-built landscape is designed to push that water off the landscape as quickly as possible. And that fundamental alteration in the natural pattern, the natural process, the natural flow of how water flows across the landscape has had many unintended consequences. One of those can be seen in a very simple experiment that was done uh, with Caltrout uh, in partnership with the UC Davis Center for Watershed Sciences and DWR just a couple years ago. Uh, this is a picture of the pumping station, the old pumping station that's just north of the I-5 bridge over Sacramento River. Uh, this is now the new station is the, the water supply, uh, surface water supply for the towns of Davis and Woodland. Um, but uh, at the time, we did a very simple thing. We took uh, cages uh, made of, of uh, plastic fence and uh, PVC pipe. Uh, attached crab floats to them. And in each one of those cages, we put 10 fish from uh, the uh, hatchery on the Feather River. Uh, those fish were each tagged so that we could track individual growth rates. The same thing was just was then done. Uh, the light's not great in here, but this is the canal. The canal is the way that, that water flows across floodplains today in the current landscape, right? So from the river, to the canal is only about 30 yards, right? And what separates it? A small pile of dirt, right? A levee. So that levee then, uh, on the other side of the levee, we did the exact same thing, three cages, 10 fish each, and just on the other side of the canal, in uh, the lands that were formerly that, that ephemeral floodplain, that uh, uh, amazing tule marshes that, that used to occupy the Yolo Basin, and are now primarily ag fields, mostly rice in a rice field that wasn't planted to rice that year because of the drought, uh, we did the same thing. We spread uh, water out and slowed it down, mimicking the natural way in which water would have flowed out across the landscape, shallow, just for several weeks, right? And we did the same thing, the same exact size of, of cage and fish. And what happened? After just three weeks, the fish that were out on the floodplain had grown substantially compared to those in the river or those in the canal. And the reason why that you had this 700% greater growth in just three weeks was very clear to see. In the Sac River, 
there were very few bugs in that water. In the canal, there were six times more, 600% more bugs, right? And that understandably resulted in greater growth. But what happened on the floodplain? You can't even see the water. What is it? It's soup. We call it zoop soup, zooplankton soup. It is liquid protein. It's energy, right? What is, it, what is 149X, really? It's 15,000% more food, right? If you're CEO of a big company and you raise the bottom line by 10%, by 15, by 50%, you're going to be in line for a big bonus, right? What are we showing here? We're showing that the system that we have built here in California, that we've inherited over the last 100, 150 years, has been squandering this incredible natural wealth. This capacity to make food, which then, of course, those bugs make fish, has been largely surgically taken out of the system. Our levees, our drainage system, creates food deserts of our rivers, right? Why? Well, one of the reasons for that and one of the really important reasons is time. The water turns over in the river every couple seconds. In the canal, every half minute. In the field, every couple of days. Residents' time of water, the time that it takes to actually build these important food webs is absolutely critical. And if you're rapidly pushing the water off the landscape, you don't have the residents' time necessary to make bugs, to make fish, to make a healthy system. So floodplains are essentially the solar panels for the system as a whole, the energy source. In summer, plants act as batteries. They capture sunlight, they hold it, they, they create sugar. That sugar is a battery. In winter, that battery is brought into the system when the, when the, uh, when the rivers spread out, when they slow down, right, when they flood. Um, in in wintertime, also, as, as those here. Virginia, would you hold this for a second? Here. This is basically what a river system looks like right now, right? You have steep, levied banks, right? You have a lot of water, but you have very little overall surface area. What does that mean? It means in winter, the only sunlight that can come into the system to be trapped by algae floating near the surface is right there between those two banks. But the moment you let the river spread out onto its natural floodplain, you have this much larger service to capture winter sunlight. That's algae capturing it in the water column, right? So whether it's summer or winter, the same thing needs to happen. You need to spread the water out. You need to slow it down. You need to mimic that natural flood, flood regime. So you know this isn't rocket science, but it is physics, right? Remember this guy, <laughs> right? He had this, this funny equation about energy equaling mass, correlating. The amount of energy that goes into the river system as a whole is going to have a direct effect on the biomass we get out. We can't be surprised if we reduce the floodplain surface by 95% that we're reduced to some small fraction of the fish biomass. That's the math that we've created. What does that mean? It means that we can uncreate it. It means that we have the potential to create a system that reintegrates this fundamental knowledge of physics, of biology, of, of hydrobiology, into how we manage, right? So sunlight can be trapped by vegetation on the floodplain, by floating algae, right? It can be turned in, uh, to, uh, into food by microbes and bacteria, which are then eaten by, by zooplankton and bugs, which make fish which, given a little time, make bigger fish, which are healthy, right? So making fish takes time. It doesn't happen instantaneously, right? And to give us that, excuse me, can we uh, hit play on this? All right. Let's see. Is there, oh, right back here, here we go. Always one. So this is the making of a floodplain fatty. This is what happens if you take a picture of that fish out there on the floodplain every day, right? This isn't magic, although it might look like it. What it is is providing enough time to let nature do its thing. And we have that capacity, but we have to design it back into the way we manage our floodplains, our bypasses, our restoration ethos. So this is what I call a pivot towards process, right? So 
Again, this is the Sacramento Valley here, the Sutter Buttes right in the middle. All the different colors just represent that mosaic of different floodplains that would have existed pre-development. This is what it looks like now, mere remnants, right? But that ground didn't disappear. On top of it there are the existing rice lands in the Sac Valley. There's been an incredible work done by many of my colleagues here, many of your colleagues over the last 30 years to show that those working lands can make incredible habitat for native species. It's our job to let those species recognize the rivers that they evolved in and are adapted to. We have a chance to do that with fish now. We have a chance to create, to work with the natural processes which create and maintain diverse habitats. Those diverse habitats have residence times necessary to, to create functioning uh, riverine uh, aquatic food webs. We can spread it, we can slow it, we can sink it back into the ground to recharge critical aquifers, and we can grow these food webs, which are the fundamental functioning of resilience. Resilience is about diversity, right? It's right there in the language. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. That's what we've done with, with channelizing our entire river system. Now we have a chance to put oxbows, side channels, floodplains, all back into. Each one of our organizations has a, has a role to play. The flood board, DFW, DWR, uh, the bird conservation, fish conservation, terrestrial birds, and, and, uh, and, and, and all the different critters, right? All of that is played on this idea of, of actually working with functioning systems that create abundance, that create diversity, and out of that diversity is born resilience. Ecological resilience, then, is the very basis of economic resilience. We can have a system that has abundant fish populations. Endangered fish are not an inevitable consequence of development. They're a direct consequence of a system built before we really understood how rivers worked and how fish used them. And with that comes this understanding that this similar kind of, of understanding of natural flow applies to understanding the flow of, of fire through forests, understanding the flow of grazers across rangelands, understanding that we have a real opportunity now to, in California, start working with the actual underlying causes of environmental decline, not just addressing the symptoms. And, and that really means that California is poised to, to really create water solutions that have global impact. And right now, I'll turn it over to my colleagues to talk about the precedent-setting work that we've already done here in the, in the, in the preceding decades to, uh, to, uh, to, to bring us to this point. So, thank you. So thank you, my name is Roger Cornwell, I'm the general manager of River Garden Farms. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working with, with this group of people here for, for quite a while. And first, uh, you know, the ag community really started off in, in birds. And that's where we, we really realized that there's this energetics model that, that can maybe we can apply it to other places. And so that's when I met Jacob Katz and, and a few others and we started kind of working in that direction. And uh, what we did is we created a simple kind of animated video that I'm going to play for you that hopefully will bring everything that Jacob was talking about together. Five percent. That's what's left of California's salmon population. Once the largest floodplain in the world, the Golden State Central Valley is a fraction of what it once was, home to an abundance of wildlife the floodplains provided everything needed for life to flourish. But in the 1800s, something changed here. People from all over the world began to settle in these fertile lands. We built cities, paved roads, and grew crops to support a booming population. Today, just 5% of the original floodplain habitat remains, which to no surprise has left us with just 5% of the native fish. However, not all is lost. Work is being done to reverse this troubling statistic. In a first-of-its-kind partnership, farmers, scientists, water districts, and conservation groups are uniting to recreate the floodplains. And their goal? To one day tell the tale of a triumphant return of California Chinook salmon. 
The collaboration is producing solutions that are as clever as they are simple, and early results show great promise. Like all species, fish need to eat. But there's simply not enough food in the river to nourish juvenile salmon for their journey to the ocean. The river is too cold and too swift to produce a stable supply of bugs which fish depend on for nutrition. Malnourished, the salmon grow weak and are unable to avoid predators and overcome spells when there's no food at all. Few ever make it to the ocean. That's why this coalition is using farm fields as a solution. A place that grows food for families during the spring and summer, turns out, is the perfect place to grow food for fish in the winter. So how does it work? Rice fields are flooded during the winter to help decompose the remaining rice straw left over from harvest. These shallow puddles serve as a massive solar panel, warming the decomposing rice straw, turning carbon into algae and creating a fertile breeding ground for millions of bugs. It's an all-you-can-eat buffet for young salmon, serving up a delicious spread of highly nutritious floating fillets, something fish used to get before they were cut off from their food supply. By using rice fields to create these surrogate floodplains, our coalition is reconnecting fish with their natural food supply. Scientists and farmers are delivering the food to the fish by pumping the bugs grown on the fields into the Sacramento River. First, water is borrowed from the river onto rice fields. There it sits, breaking plant life down into carbon. Sunlight warms the water, forming algae and attracting insects to feast and reproduce. This water, now dense with nutrients, is moved right back into the river, creating a vital food supply for young fish. This new food supply gives young salmon a vastly improved shot at survival. It's a win-win solution. Standing together, our collective efforts today ensure our success tomorrow. This is the new way forward. And hopefully that just kind of helped fill in some of that, that background that Jacob was talking about. And now I'm going to turn this over to, to a colleague of mine to talk about birds and, and how they're, they're using the rice fields. Thank you, Roger. So my name's Megan Hurdle. I'm with Audubon, California, and I want to thank everyone for joining us over their lunch. I was watching that video, and there was a lot of references to buffet, so hopefully everyone's doing okay, <laughs> not thinking too much about food. And also, Secretary, my birthday's next week, and I'm wondering if you'll help me with the invite list, because <laughs> clearly you have more friends than I do. But I really do appreciate everyone coming out today. So my job is to lift your eyes up from the rivers and streams to overhead to talk a little bit about birds and why the Central Valley matters for birds and why it's imperative that we work with landowners and find solutions that work for birds and people in this place we call home. So just like salmon, there are many birds that migrate, right? So salmon, they start in streams, they go out to the ocean, they return to their spawning grounds. Well, we have migratory birds that do much of the same thing and rely on the Central Valley as part of that life cycle. So we've got birds that are flying thousands of miles along this incredible journey, and they're flying along flyways, basically super highways in the sky. How many people have walked outside of their house during fall or winter here in Sacramento and have heard the birds overhead? That's birds on the flyway. A lot of people in Sacramento don't even realize that's happening, but it demonstrates just how important the Central Valley is as part of one of these flyways. So the flyway we're gonna talk about today is the Pacific Flyway, and that's because we are right along its migratory route. So what we do here in the Central Valley really matters for these birds that are flying thousands of miles, linking us across countries and across hemispheres. So we have neotropical migrants that are coming here in spring and summer to breed. And then in winter, we get these phenomenal numbers of wintering water birds that are either coming here to stop and stay for winter or stopping here and resting and refueling before they continue along their journey. And one of the best examples for why what we do here matters is this bird. Who can identify this bird for me? Well done. I think, I think I heard most people say Aleutian goose. There might have been some Canada's in there. We're going to go with Aleutian. Uh, the difference is this tiny little neck band, the white neck band there, and it's a smaller bird. So this bird was actually thought to be extinct. We thought it was gone. And then a small number were found breeding on the Aleutian Islands off of Alaska. And then efforts to reduce predators both in their breeding grounds and then here in the Central Valley in their wintering grounds, where 90% of them come, have led to a full recovery of this species. 
This is one of the few species that's actually been removed from the endangered species list. And that's because we were able to do work both where they breed, but also here in the Central Valley. And a lot of that work revolved around partnering with landowners to protect and enhance their winter habitat. So I think each one of us that talks today highlights this. And we usually go through it pretty quickly, but the reason we all talk about the landscape level change is because what we have done in the Central Valley is fully changed what birds and fish and people see in less than 200 years. I was just in Greece two weeks ago. 200 years is like a second in that timeline. But we've lost 90 to 95%, not just of our floodplain habitat, but of our riverside forests and our wetland habitat. But despite that, you can still see things like this. So if you were to go out to the Yolo Bypass in fall or winter, you could see this, thousands of snow geese crowded in. And we get phenomenal numbers of birds still. Historically, it would have been 20 to 40 million waterfowl. Can you imagine what that would have been like? Tremendous number. We get about five to seven now. Imagine how loud it would be when you walk outside at winter if there were 20 to 40 million waterfowl going over your home. Still hundreds of thousands of shorebirds come here. And the reason we have these high numbers of birds still is both that we've protected the last remaining wetlands through public and private wetlands, and that we've partnered with farmers to create surrogate habitat, to really mimic what habitat was historically. So I want to give credit to Virginia Getz, who's going to present later, because I stole this map from Ducks Unlimited. So I hope you know that this is in my presentation. But this is really what birds are looking at when they come down here. So the bright colors you see on here are our remaining public and private wetlands. Now, if you zoom into the Sacramento Valley, all of that green is rice ground. So these birds, when they're coming here, they are really relying both on those last remnant wetlands that we've got, but also on the habitat they're getting in rice fields. Two thirds of waterfowl diet is coming from rice fields. Some of the highest densities of wintering waterfowl in the world we have here in the valley. And it's actually, the rice ground is designated as a site of hemispheric importance for shorebirds. Particularly owl's farm, it's just to call you out. <laughs> you need to get a new sign up about uh, just how important your farm is. So Audubon and many of our partners have been working with rice growers for more than a decade. And the way we work with them is we talk about what the birds need. We come up with ways they can manage their land and water to benefit birds. We go out and study it and test it. And when we prove that it works for the birds and the farmers, we work with agencies to try to take them to scale. Historically, our main partner has been Natural Resource Conservation Service. We're really excited now to be partnering with the Department of Fish and Wildlife on a project to also roll some of these practices out. These practices can be really simple. It's something like holding water longer in your field into spring to benefit shorebirds. Making the water be two inches instead of six inches so you're benefiting a different type of birds. These is, this is not rocket science, as Jacob says it, but these are simple things we can do on the landscape to benefit birds. So with that, I'm gonna leave you with a bird's eye view. You can see why if you were a bird flying over this landscape in winter, you would look at a flooded rice field and be like, oh, I do think that looks like wetland habitat or flood habitat. Water choices in California are not always easy. We're certainly gonna have to make some hard decisions coming up, but birds and fish evolve together and there are opportunities to partner with landowners to think about ways to mimic that and recreate it. So at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Roger, to, oh, not Roger, Lewis, to tell you a little bit more about some of those projects. So thanks, Megan. I, I'm Lewis Spear. I'm the manager of Reclamation District 108, and I'm an engineer, and I like to build stuff. So I am uh, going to talk about the opportunities that are out there and some of the things that we can get done. And you heard others. Uh, well, let me tell you a little bit about 108. 108 is uh, located in the middle of all the floodplains, and we're a reclamation district because we built levees. Um, we created some of this problem that we're talking about right now. But I think what's exciting is we see ways that we can go forward with uh, uh, kind of modernizing that infrastructure so it still works for farms, but it also works for, for the environment. So uh, waterfowl, um, well, we were, most of you know, we, uh, we were burning rice straw for a long time. When that stopped, um, there was an incredible success that was found when we started flooding rice fields. And I'm fortunate working in the Sacramento Valley, we have a bunch of folks that have just experienced that and they've really come together with a let's just fix it approach. So we came into the drought, um, salmon were suffering and my board said, well, what can we do about it? How can we engage? 
And we really started on a comprehensive salmon recovery program under NACWA's leadership with David Guy. And on the Sacramento River, we really have been targeting kind of three separate activities uh, in the upper Sacramento, um, in the main stem of the Sacramento, and then on the floodplain. So I'll briefly talk about the uh, first two, and then we'll spend most of our time on the floodplains. But on the upper Sacramento River, you know, we have fish spawning where they never spawned before, right? Our salmon are spawning and redding. So there's a lot of work to be done up there to make that work. Um, Shasta Dam cuts them off from their original spawning grounds. So we have projects that are ongoing and active, supported by the Central Valley Project Improvement Act and other uh, opportunities. But what you have is you have spawning gravel projects in the top right, you have side channels in the bottom right, and you have in-river habitat projects on the bottom left that are all activities um, that have been engaged by Sac River settlement contractors and other folks here in the room. In-channel, um, actually I saw Mark Young earlier, the project on the bottom left shows a field. It's actually an oxbow that is within the flood control levees and Westervelt stepped up and constructed a project where they took the farm field on the bottom left, actually degraded it so that it would be flooded more frequently. And now what we have is an oxbow on the top right that's kind of a backwater, backwater on the Sacramento River that's frequently inundated, provides habitat and uh, um, primary production for um, out-migrating uh, salmon on the Sacramento River. The other thing that uh, kind of fits into this for us is you know, you can imagine the, there's about 550,000 acres of rice in the Sacramento Valley. About half of that ends up getting flooded each winter. And the current practice right now is to flood it and hold the water all winter. So there's no exchanging of that water. The food production that we talked about or Jacob talked about and Roger showed the video takes about a month to develop. So we have guys that are flooding their rice fields. They hold that water for about a month, just like they would have for decomp. Although with decomposition, they would have held it for three months. But now the idea is maybe we hold it for a month, we exchange that water with the river so that the food enriched water goes back to the river and we exchange that for some new water. And we can do that two or three times a winter. If you can imagine a tapestry of that happening in the Sacramento Valley, you could have this constant food supply for the main stem of the Sacramento River. And we think it has real opportunity to, to affect those in river fish. So finally, the, the Sacramento River, and this is my version of the uh, floodplain uh, map. And I, on the left-hand side here, the blue shaded areas are essentially the areas that still get wet, parts of that floodplain that still exist. Uh, much of it doesn't have, or some of it doesn't have access uh, for juvenile um, salmon. Some of it has access, but only infrequently. And what I think of this as is our low-hanging fruit where we could engage the existing infrastructure and really try to, to make make this land landscape work for us. The top right photo is actually the, the Tisdale uh, weir and bypass, which I'll speak a little bit more about. So um, this is just a little bit 101 um, on how the Sacramento River system works, because um, I've found that most folks, it's just, it's not intuitive and they don't, uh, they don't see it every day like I do. I, I live in about the middle of this map and eat dinner there. So it's very relevant for me, but so the Sacramento River on the top right is, is largely within its banks. It's that little channel that you heard Jacob talk about. But as it fills up, it has to actually get to fairly high flows before it overtops our weir structures. And when it overtops our weir structures, these are big structures. So we go from almost no flow to very high flow in our bypasses. So the first one to flow in that system is Tisdale that I mentioned earlier. And here's a, a photo of that Tisdale weir. So it's several hundred yards wide. And you can see here that it's, it's basically just a lowered L levee section. Once the Sacramento River gets a little over uh, 20,000 cubic feet per second, water starts to flow into the Tisdale bypass and then into the, the uh, Sutter bypass downstream. And there's about 12,500 acres that get wet when that happens. So then the Calusa Weir is the second to flow in the Sacramento, and then the Molten Weir. And if you look further up in that photo at the top of the Butte Sink, there actually are other places where water spills out that uh, you could modernize infrastructure to spill more frequently. So a notched weir is essentially that same, that same situation, only now we lower the elevation of the weir. Not the whole weir, but a small section of the weir. And this is what's just happened um, 
over the last decade, there's been a process for the Fremont Weir, right? So the beauty of this is you have smaller, more frequent, lower flows that enter the bypass and create that ideal floodplain habitat. So now if you have a notched weir, you can get water out earlier. Um, and, and this is just a little graphic to illustrate the, the difference that can make. So in 2003 and 2004, the uh, natural hydrology over the weirs meant that 41 days the Tisdale and Lower Sutter Bypass had water coming in through the Tisdale Bypass. If you notched that weir, you created a notch, and this is about the elevation you can do in that location, um, you would change that um, by more than double. So instead of 41 days, you'd be looking at 91 days. So you can modernize this infrastructure, and that's, that's looking at the non-farm season. So you still have farming going on, but December 1st, after everybody's farmed, you can lower the elevations to be a gated notch. You could lower it starting December 1st. You could allow that water and fish, juveniles to enter the bypass. Um, you can more than double the amount of time you'd have that floodplain habitat. And then when you came up, when you're about to get back into the farming season, you could raise that gate up, have it perform how it would historically have performed. This is just a little graphic. The green line is the, the actual water surface elevation of the river. The top yellow line is the actual elevation of the weir today. The red line that's lower is actually the notch, the bottom of that notch. So whenever the green line passes that red line at the bottom, water starts to flow, unlike today where it would have to reach the yellow line at the top. So this simple project could have a dramatic impact on 12,500 acres. You can use the high flows for recruiting a juveniles, for getting lots of juveniles on, and then you can use the lower notch flows for keeping that floodplain um, going um, to provide that habitat while the juveniles are, are rearing. So my message is simply let's get to work, right? There's, there's a, lot of, a lot of talk here and I, rooms like this um, are very exciting. A lot of us do a lot of tours. This group does a lot of tours, but I think there's some really exciting opportunities on the landscape. I represent farmers and water users. They're ready. They're ready to partner with folks like yourself at the agencies and with the NGO partners to get some of this stuff done. Um, so let's not waste any more time. So with that, I'll pass it back to... Uh, to oh. Okay, I, you know, I, I, one takeaway that I would like everybody to, to leave here with is, is when you look at us, you know, this coalition of people here that, that came together to do this talk, we're all from very different backgrounds. You know, I farm, Lewis is an engineer that runs the water district, and then we have Megan, who's, who's a conservation, you know, organization about birds, and, and then also uh, Jacob Katz, and then we have Virginia, sorry. Uh, but uh, we've worked hard to build some trust. You know, it took a lot to, for all of us to come out of our silos. In 2000, uh, the drought through the 2014, 13, 14, that, that was what spawned it for, for the group that I represent, for the farms, for my, my farm and, and the area that I represent, really got us to look at what can we do different? What, what changes can we make to help improve salmon? We've taken that step for the birds uh, but what's next? And then, and then this, this momentum just keeps going, right? And then I've met all these people and we just keep going and it's getting bigger. And, and so that momentum is, is carrying us to somewhere new every time. And that's what uh, I want this video to take, for everybody to take home is the, is the cooperation that, that started now. For decades, rice farmers would burn their fields to get rid of the stubble left over from harvest. But in the 90s, regulation changed that. So we turned to flooding the fields. <laughs> 
Essentially, flooding the fields does the same thing. It decomposes the rice straw. But what nobody knew, what none of us predicted, was the wind for the birds. They'd fly over, and they would recognize these flooded rice fields as wetlands. They really are using this land as surrogate wetland habitat, which is really important because there's not much natural wetland habitat left here. We've lost 90 to 95% of it, and rice now provides up to 60% more food and habitat for waterfowl in the winter. What we're learning now is that that same water on the floodplain has great benefits for fish. The infrastructure that we have today was designed and built for a purpose 100 years ago, without a lot of time spent on how it might impact fish. Irrigation is the principal purpose for which man has developed the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers in the great Central Valley of California. If you look back 150 years ago before the gold rush, the salmon population was the most abundant king salmon population really in the world. We basically had free-flowing rivers that came down into this large central valley that was a big floodplain. And when the people started showing up, we, we had to control the rivers because we were moving in. Our cities were next to the river. Our agriculture was next to the river. We've built a system that has made over 95% of these floodplain wetlands no longer accessible to the river and to the fish in the river. We now have a system where we store the water behind dams for good reason, right? We need it in the summer for irrigation. We need to protect our cities and towns from floods. But in doing so and in channelizing all of our rivers, we've changed the way the system works. And you see that reflected in the crashing numbers of fish. The salmon and trout populations in California are completely dependent on human management at this point. They're not gonna make it without us giving them a boost and managing our water and our land resources. I look at that and I say, here's, here's real potential. Here's potential for, for small tweaks that result in revolutionary change. Traditionally, environmentalists and private landowners have been at odds with conservation and resource management issues. I think you had a lot of folks kind of fighting for positional arguments, and the drought really forced folks to say, hey, look, right or wrong, we all got to get together and get to work on fixing this. We needed a couple of partners to like take that leap with us, and uh, River Garden Farms who are willing to take a risk and, and try something different um, just to see if it worked. We really saw people that we'd never worked with before and started working together to really manage the water resources here in California. And it was through that cooperation that we started to move forward with projects that we feel are very viable and that can help the ecosystem. And without them, we'd be nowhere. We need somewhere to, to try stuff out. Everything needs to eat. You know, just like we do, just like the salmon do, the bugs need to eat too. The rice fields are a perfect place to grow them because there's a lot of leftover organic material that breaks down into little bits of nutrients that the bugs can eat. Today, we're actually working on uh, an exciting part of the project, which is draining these rice fields and tracking the the flow of the plankton in that water, uh, out with the water, back to the river. The first thing we do when we show up today is, is pull a board out of the rice box and let a bunch of water flow out of the field. And our job is to sample along that trajectory for, for water quality and for plankton density. Cool, looks good. We're sampling for um, lower trophic level productivity, so that means basically small crustacean life, essentially. So we got a bunch of uh, large-bodied cladocerans. That's a good sign. That's like the prime rib of fish food. And then a bunch of small ones as well, which is another good sign. That means they're reproducing really well. They got a healthy population. Or good, good fish food, basically. Large body clodocerans, that's, that's what we're looking for. Check out this sample that uh, Jacob just pulled out of the field. Is this what it's been looking like lately? Mostly. 
you know, almost every field. But this, we had three weeks where we didn't get much growth out of, out of this field here, and then it just exploded. The food's out here on the floodplain. We can grow that food here and get it back to the fish in the river. We can build a system that grows food for people in summer, but those same fields in winter can create habitat for ducks, for geese, for fish, create the raw productivity to make that system work. So now this is really a, a model for the 21st century for resource management and for California. To make this work, it takes folks like River Garden, those that have the vision that do something that hasn't been done before, do it right, and really set a model for the future. We can use our resources, our water, our land, and re-time the, the way things have been to benefit the whole ecosystem. We can benefit birds, we can benefit fish, we can benefit all the critters that are out here by us remanaging uh, how we use our resources. These are win-win solutions. These are projects that work for farmers, that work for environmentalists, that work for folks to the south of the Delta and up here in the Sacramento Valley. That we are creating a new model, and that model is really all about understanding how nature works and integrating that knowledge into our management of it. The new way forward is really figuring out how to make every acre of land have multiple benefits. Make it work for people in growing food. Make it work for birds who need winter or summer habitat. Make it work for fish. We've got to figure out a way to have multiple benefits and to use the limited resources that we've got as smartly as possible. And that's both for wildlife and people. I think if we're going to have fish rebound, it's projects like this. And that this is where we build the foundation of that knowledge that we ultimately drive policy with. We can continue fighting, you know, to the bitter end, but no one's really gonna win in that scenario. I don't see any, any losers when we do it this way. It's a win for the fish, it's a win for the birds, and it's a win for people. I don't know a single farmer who doesn't wanna see more ducks, more salmon. We have the capacity here in the Sacramento Valley to demonstrate a model that has real global importance, that shows that you don't have to choose either or, that you can create a landscape that works for people, that works for the environment, that creates food for people in summer, that creates food for ducks, for geese, for fish, for all of our native critters the year round. And that's something that I'm just proud to be part of. Okay, with that, um, now I'd like to just introduce Virginia. Uh, she's going to be our last speaker to take this thing home. Good afternoon. I'm Virginia Gatz, Manager of Conservation Programs for Ducks Unlimited. I've been told to step on the gas here because we're a little behind, so I may skip over some things um, a little bit uh, to get us to the finish line. Um, there are already success stories of multi-benefit restoration projects that reconnect the water and the land, and they set the stage for the new way forward, and I'm going to show you some examples. Reactivating the floodplain and reconnecting the water to the land requires a comprehensive approach, and improvements are needed from the top of the system on the upper rivers down to the bottom of the system in the San Francisco Bay. We'll start near the bottom of the system at San Pablo Bay and work our way up uh, through a couple of the drainages that ultimately feed into the bay. The Napa plant site restoration project took about 1,135 acres that were formerly in salt pond production and were separated from the bay by a dike, and it restored tidal influence to those areas. This was about a $13.4 million undertaking, and it required funding from a variety of public and private entities. That's not the only restoration project that's happened in the San Pablo Bay, and you can see real quick the areas shown in blue are either sites that have been restored or are in the process of being restored, and the hatched area shows a site where restoration is planned. 
Here's some pictures of the Napa plant restoration site prior to uh, the project, and you can see it's a pretty inhospitable environment for both fish and wildlife. Tidal influence uh, to the area was established by lowering the internal levees on the former salt ponds and then breaching the dike um, in several places where historic slough channels existed. These aerial views uh, show you prior to restoration on the left and then about eight months after restoration on the right. And you can see the former salt pond dikes, you know, on the left-hand photo. And you can see the uh, historic slough channels in both of those photos. So restoring the tidal uh, connection to this land, it provided better habitat, more food for fish, for waterfowl, um, and a variety of special status species, including salmon, snowy plover, ridgeways, rail, and salt marsh harvest mouse. Now moving up the system, um, up the Consumnes River, we recently completed the Cougar Wetlands Restoration Project, which restored uh, about 154 acres of floodplain habitat um, for fish and a variety of other species. Again, it was a multi-partner undertaking uh, with funding coming from a variety of sources. We reconnected fresh water uh, to this floodplain by breaching the dike, constructed a series of swales on the interior of the property that help convey fresh water into the site when the tide is up and the river level's high, and then help convey water back out of the site as the tide goes down and the river level drops. Fish now have access to the floodplain in this area. And this area is producing um, invertebrates, which provide food for fish, waterfowl, and a whole bunch of other species. And it's providing food that not only can be consumed on the site, but that also is conveyed back out to the river daily as the tide goes down and the river level drops. And then we'll finish up north on Butte Creek, which is a tributary to the Sacramento River. And the Butte Creek Fish Passage Improvement Project might be our greatest success story to date for multi-benefit floodplain restoration work. It demonstrates how a group of diverse stakeholders, including state and federal resource agencies, water districts, farmers, private duck club owners, um, and NGOs came together to tackle this very tough project to make safe fish, fish passage along Butte Creek. And it allowed the system to continue to function for agricultural supply and drainage, flood control, and to support about 12,000 acres of privately owned wetlands in the Butte Sink, which provides some of the most important waterfowl habitat, not just in the Sacramento Valley, but in the entire Pacific Flyway. Several dams were removed on Butte Creek, and uh, many fish-friendly, high-tech structures were installed on the creek to ensure safe passage for spring run salmon. And so, this project resulted in restoration of the spring run from about 200 fish to more than 20,000 fish. So it is truly a win for all interest. These are just a few examples of um, what's already been accomplished and what we can accomplish at an even greater scale moving forward. Through partnering, we, we can deliver these types of projects on the Sacramento River floodplain and provide multiple benefits for, and multiple land and water uses. With that, I'm going to hand this off to the Director of Fish and Wildlife, Mr. Chuck Bonham. So it's true, my name is Chuck Bonham, and I'm still the Director of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. I've got no slides. No science, no law, no policy, just a little bit of emotion. And this is the audience participation time. How are all y'all doing? I, I, that wasn't loud enough. Did you learn something in the last hour? Then put your hands together for Secretary Crowfoot.
So this building, the people that work in this building, natural resources, it should be a home of innovation, inquisition, challenge, science, and the inaugural event here, I hope, leads to many. And thank you for doing that, Wade. All right, what we have left today is nothing compared to what we once had, right? When I was in a prior job at Trot Unlimited, we boiled our work down into four words. Protect the most important places, reconnect them, restore landscapes with private landowners because of the fact of the matter, most animals and plants are on private property, and sustain that work with a movement. People, you gotta put people into it. When I look out here, I see the beginning of a movement for floodplain fatties, you agree? Yeah. That's not nearly loud enough. Come on now. I would argue the most amazing journey in the natural world is that of a salmon. They're born in a river. They swim out that river. They spend time in an ocean. And then magically, something goes off in their makeup, and they swim back to the very same spot where they were born to start the cycle again. If that doesn't give you hope, solace, satisfaction in these desperate times, I don't know what will. There's something you can do. There's something we can do. I read an article a while ago. A reporter at the Washington Post interviewed a guy named Mike McHenry, he was a biologist for a tribe in the Elwha Basin on the Olympic Peninsula, where we've had one of the most accomplished and successful dam removals occur in the nation. And he told the reporter, when he got into fisheries biology, he didn't expect to be working with bulldozers and excavators. But along his journey, he realized if you want nature back, sometimes you gotta go big. We've lost so much, I would submit we've got to go big. We can do this. We can bring the salmon back. We can recreate this lost habitat. California is asking us to get that done. And in the immortal words of Dr. Seuss, unless someone like you cares a whole heck of a lot, nothing's going to get better. It's not. It's easy to say what you're against. It's easy to find the reasons to say no. I know what I'm for. I'm for floodplain fatties. Are you? Yeah. I'm for reconnecting nature and giving it a chance to roam. Are you? Yeah. Thanks for your time. Let me turn it back to the secretary. Great. Thank you, Chuck. Those are eloquent and fitting last words. I would just say this. Thank you for being part of uh, this first event. Uh, look for more of it. And if you have suggestions on future topics, you'll see uh, an email on the placard outside uh, of our colleague, colleague Lizzie Williamson. Uh, get in touch with her to suggest uh, additional uh, subjects. Thanks so much.